This question is about rolling motion and conservation of energy. So pause the recording and have a read through the question carefully. So in this question, we have a solid disc of radius r and a solid sphere also of radius r. I'll show that that's solid by a little bit of artistry. There we go. And each of those have um, a mass of m. And they are rolling down a slope. And we're asked to find the velocity of each of them at the bottom so we can compare the two. And we're asked to do this using energy considerations. So at the top of the slope, each of these objects has gravitational potential energy, which as they roll down the slope will be converted into kinetic energy. So by the law of conservation of energy, we can say that the gravitational potential energy at the top will equal the kinetic energy gained by each object by the bottom. And for a rolling object, the kinetic energy actually comes in two parts. There'll be a linear component to the kinetic energy, and there will also be a rotational component. So gravitational potential energy is given by the mass of the object times gravitational acceleration times the height that it falls through. And the linear kinetic energy of an object is half times the mass times the linear velocity squared. And the rotational kinetic energy of an object half times the moment of inertia i times the angular velocity squared. So first, let's consider our solid disk. Just so we know what we're talking about. And for the solid disk, from our standard formula sheet, the moment of inertia, the moment of inertia is given by a half times the mass of the object times the radius squared. If we compare that to our solid sphere. The moment of inertia of the solid sphere, again from the standard formula sheet, is two fifths times the mass times the radius squared. And we know that in this case the masses and the radii are the same. So already we can have a look at this and draw a few conclusions. So if the mass is the same, the radius is the same. The only difference between these two expressions is the constants. And we can tell from this that the moment of inertia of the solid disk is going to be greater than the moment of inertia for the solid sphere. So see if you can have a think about that and make a prediction about which you think might have the greatest velocity at the bottom. But we're not going to guess this. We're actually going to work through the, the maths here and see which will come up with the greatest velocity. So let's do that now. So let's start by substituting our expression for the moment of inertia for the solid disk into our expression that we got from the MG conservation law. And that gives us that MGH is equal to half mv squared for the disk plus a half times our moment of inertia, which is a half times mr squared times the angular velocity of the disk squared. And we can spot that each of these terms has mass in it. So if that's common, that can cancel out. And simplifying that down just gives us that gravitational acceleration times height is equal to a half times the velocity of the disk squared times a quarter times the radius squared times the angular velocity of the disk squared. We can also go back and do this for our sphere. So in this case, mgh equals a half times the mass times velocity of the sphere squared plus a half times two fifths times the mass times the radius squared times the angular velocity of the sphere squared. And again, mass cancelled out and we're left with gh equals half times the velocity squared plus a fifth times the radius squared times the angular velocity of the sphere squared. So let's consider for a moment the relationship between the linear velocity of the rolling object and its angular velocity. So if we have um, a slope and we have our object on the slope, it's traveling with a linear velocity v. So the center of mass of the object is moving down the slope with this velocity. So let's consider a point here, and let's consider a whole rotation later. So if the object rotates one whole rotation, it will be further down the slope, and that point has got back to where it started. And the distance between these two points 
for a whole rotation will just be equal to the circumference of the object. So that will be 2 pi times the radius. So our velocity of the object is the distance it's travelled, so 2 pi r divided by the time taken, so delta t. And we can do the same kind of consideration for the angular velocity. So the angular velocity of the object will be the angle that it has moved through divided by the time taken. And for one whole revolution, to get back to its starting point, it's revolved through 2 pi radians, so it will be 2 pi over delta t. And combining these two expressions, we can see that the velocity of the object, the linear velocity of the object, is given by the angular velocity multiplied by the radius. So we can use this relationship that the linear velocity is equal to the angular velocity times the radius. And rearranging that, the angular velocity is the linear velocity divided by the radius. And we can substitute this into our expressions. So substituting that in for our solid disk gives us gh equals a half times the linear velocity of the disk squared plus a quarter times the linear velocity of the disk squared which is three quarters of the linear velocity squared equals gh so we can rearrange that to find the velocity of the disk is the square root of four thirds times gravitational acceleration times the height of the slope. Doing the same for our sphere gives us the result that the velocity of the sphere is the square root of 10 over 7 times gh. So we can do what we originally asked to do, which is compare these two. And if you look at the numbers, 10 divided by 7 is greater than 4 over 3. So the linear velocity of the sphere at the bottom of the slope will be greater than the linear velocity of the disk. So let's just take a moment and see if this makes sense to us. So going back to look at the moments of inertia of the two objects, the solid disk had a greater moment of inertia than the solid sphere. So inertia is resistance to change in motion. So if the moment of inertia is greater, it'll have a greater resistance in change in motion, which is why its velocity is lower when it gets to the bottom. So this does make sense, thankfully, in this case.